my goodness. It's been a hard week. Let's just be honest about that. Um, and I've been on tour, actually, weirdly, this whole week. I had to leave Wednesday morning and pass through Colorado and then to Virginia and then to Vermont and then here. And I can tell you for a fact, the whole nation is grieving and nobody is making eye contact in my sampling of four airports. Um, and so it's been a really weird year to have to come to a podium and start to try to read poems about like tomatoes. Uh, and I've been trying to make my peace with that. And I think the argument itself is interesting. But I just wanna say what an honor it is to be here. There's nobody in the poetry world that I respect more than Robert Pinsky, um, who I loved from the moment he was uh, composing peons to San Pablo Avenue, the, the rusty bars along the strip where I grew up in El Cerrito, California, to the moment he became my graduate professor at Boston University, to the moment I get to read with him now on my second book. And I just, um, you know, to me, he's one of the great statesmen of American letters and um, a truly kind person also which, you know, sometimes they don't go together, let's be honest. And in Robert, they really do. And, you know, Catherine Coles, I love you also. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, usually what happens is that you start with, an, with all your book poems and then you read a, a new poem, but I'm just going to start with a, a brand new poem and I'm just going to go there. And then I'm going to read a book about tomatoes and I'm going to read a little bit of, um, of criticism, actually, of poetry criticism from this amazing book called The Government of the Tongue by Seamus Heaney, who um, left Belfast, Ireland in 1971 to go to Berkeley because it was sunny and peaceful and he could think about writing. And, you know, I'm leaving for Belfast in... Um, in a month, and all I can think is, I'll get some rest. So Robert, for El Cerrito. They are bulldozing the terrible building that was my junior high school, Portola Middle School, they called it PMS, we said. We felt that awful often packed together in our teenage sadness, finding out the colors of our skins in the long hallways in classes of 42 students, learning our codings, locker numbers, gangs. Mrs. Nagasaki, Mr. Hall, Mrs. Thiessen, Mrs. Mitchell, the principal in his bad polyester sour breath, our district almost always bankrupt, our, lunch, our lunches sweating in their faded packages, long buses idling in the blaring heat. We still belonged to one another, to the dark hallways of our childhood, to the occasional explosions of violence, and not yet to the wars that would be waged in our names, and not yet to the streets where some of us would be shot, and not wholly to the painful paths of class and skin, still together in some womb of childhood, underfunded tarmacs, tetherball, no textbooks, no teachers, some days no toilet paper. We paced the dark halls from, what some, from which some of us headed nearly immediately to prison. That sweet, lo talking, long-lashed boy who taught us to use a combination lock. The one who told me I was pretty for a white girl. Dead. Now dead. I hold his name, a dry leaf that rattles on my heart. That terrible valence was not wholly clear yet. All that sweaty suffering how we danced and sprayed our bangs high to boys to men, me and Gibran and my one red guess mini skirt, the brash laughter before we shattered into our futures. It was all always in a landslide zone. It wandered over a terrible fault line broken below itself while above the fire alarms went off. We waited endlessly on the bleak long tarmac of our lives to be let in to see if we might be let in. Oh, they are tearing down the terrible hull of the school. Soon the whole thing will be returned to Schist Hillside. Perhaps someone will replant it with the wildflowers which the legends say were blooming when the original conquistadores came.
This is my second book, and it's a book about working on a small-scale farm in western Massachusetts for a year. And I was a Berkeley kid, and I read Robert Pinsky when I was a teenager, and I worked in Alice Waters Community Garden that became the edible, edible schoolyard. And then later I got to live in a rural area on a grant, and I asked them, while I was there writing poems, could I work in a community garden? And they laughed, and they said, there are no community gardens here, but there are farms. And that is how I ended up working for one year on one farm on three acres in western Massachusetts. And while I did, I thought about the tradition of farm poetry and how many people have lived working in their bodies through time and made songs about it. And I read Hesiod and Virgil and John Clare and Houseman and then I wrote this book called Work and Days. And it says, why linger? Why stay in this world of oak and tree and rock? And this is from Hesiod's Theogony. Stockbridge. From Wisconsin before it was Wisconsin, a glacier hauled these stones you stand on. They traveled on its rubble. They are the glacier's spit, its fissured teeth, the path it garbled on its travel. In 1880, the stock bridge, last of the Mohicans, were removed to Wisconsin, white edict impassive as a glacier. This town and farm and gabled houses all are built upon that absence. Now you bend into this field to clear it. You think of frozen fist of ice sheets melting, glaciers lost in too warm early weather. The west wind blows in from Wisconsin. Each stone you touch is cold as bone, as if it holds some trace of spirit. It was strange to be alone up in the Berkshires on, even on a grant that was supposed to allow me time to make poetry, but this book was partly about the anxiety that generates poetry. So this poem is called Time on Earth. Time on Earth. One. New to country stars, you try to identify the constellations. Cassiopeia, Andromeda, you half forget their stories. But on warming nights you see them and your throat fills with hymns. Some ancestral bodies hold fast tunes to which your words are blurred or also blurring. Two, you read about physologist, Greek cosmologist, mythic namer of the universe. You bar borrow Amy's Audubon and wander trying to match shoots in mulch to names. Embryonic skunk cabbage, jack in the pulpit, maple spangling the forest air. You dream an orrery of leaves and bones. You say Tauhi and Kalikat and walk repeating names you've gathered just to feel their pleasure on your tongue. You call Earth Star, Club Moss, and Viburnum. Three. Beyond this, the constellated light map. Oil drums, tankers, spirochetes, terrorists, radios, specimens, ice cream, methamphetamine, pandemics, global economic crisis. Then you burn the paper, watch its turquoise flame. This is not always, but you think, this is my time on Earth. Today, a thumb-sized frog clambered up the screen. Underbelly shaking, skin grappling, all elements, a scrambling borderland, a moving, porous country. Watching, you forgot to feel alone. Delightedly, you called a frog, a frog, out to the rustling woods. And that was all. O oh, wriggler, with your sudden hope, you also sang your own short springtime song. Apocalypto for a small planet. 
Ein. And the radio reports how in 2050 farming Massachusetts will be like farming Georgia. All's flux. No one can say what will grow in Georgia, where maples will grow then, or whose fine taps will sap sugar from the cold in spring. Will we get syrup from the boreal forest, peaches from Massachusetts? Two. Drone strikes and opium poppies, oil spills and poison wells, drought zone, famine, war zone. Three, artisanal, this little intervention. What gift this day? Four, my inner cynic says don't bother, this is navel gazing, and my friend at Yale says my hunger to be near zucchinis will not save the planet from real hunger, except I remember in the film on gleaning when the priest in his compassion says those who glean now out of spiritual hunger also should be fed. Five. Ecosystem of yard or field or mind. These cucumbers are more art than science, more daydream than global action, if we separate the two. But digging now, I feel an otherness, life a great and human freedom. Here I work a plot that also grounds. As I said, it's been kind of a hard week. So I'm going to talk <laughs> about what Seamus Haney has to offer. Many poems, many, many good poems, but he also has this advice. He's writing in an essay called The Government of the Tongue. And he says, 44 years ago in October 1942 in wartime London, when he was at work at Little Gidding, Eliot wrote a letter to E. Martin Brown, and he said, in the midst of what is going on now, it is hard when you sit down at a desk to feel confident that morning after morning spent fiddling with words and rhythms is justified activity, especially as there is never any certainty that the whole thing won't have to be scrapped. And on the other hand, external or public activity is more of a drug than is this solitary toil, which often seems so pointless. And here's what Heaney adds. He says, here's the great paradox of poetry and of the imaginative arts in general. Faced with the brutality of the historical onslaught, they are practically useless. Yet they verify our singularity. They strike and stake out the ore of self which lies at the base of every individuated life. In one sense, the efficacy of poetry is nil. No lyric has ever stopped a tank. In another sense, it is unlimited. It is like the writing in the sand in the face of which accusers and accused are left speechless and renewed. I'm just gonna finish with two poems, one of which is not by me. One of which is by A.E. Houseman. Loveliest of trees, the cherry now is hung with bloom along the bough and stands about the woodland ride wearing white for Easter tide. And now of my three score years and ten, twenty will not come again and take from seventy springs a score, it only leaves me fifty more. And since to look at things in bloom, fifty springs is little room. About the woodlands I will go and see the cherry hung with snow. And so I'll leave you with this poem, Hung with Snow. Houseman was right. Your life is short. To miss even this springtime would be an error. Thank you. Thanks, Tess. I always love to hear you recite Houseman.
one of my favorite things. It's uh, such a great pleasure to be here and uh, an honor and a pleasure to read with uh, Robert and with Tess both. I was remembering as I was walking down um, and then Robert and I were talk talking about um, friends who have gone, who have left us. Uh, I was remembering my old teachers, uh, Larry Levis and Mark Strand, and a story that Larry used to tell uh, about a time when they were both living in, New in Utah, but they happened to be in New York. And they met for a drink and, of course, came to the Strand and roused around and then met again at the front desk and left the store. And Larry said, God, I just don't believe it. They're not carrying my books. And Mark said, oh, that's too bad. They're sold out of mine. Um, I haven't tried this before, but I'm going to try it tonight. I hope that it works. Um, I was working on this book for quite a while, and then the National Science Foundation sent me to Antarctica. So in the middle of writing this book, I took a year off and wrote this book, which came out while I was finishing this book. So this book sort of came out in the middle of the other book, and they're very different in ways. Um, it's Tess who made me think of doing this. It's a change of plan. But um, Flight is very sort of domestic and full of love poems. Um, and uh, The Earth is Not Flat, the Antarctica book, it um, has something of a different tenor. So I'm going to start with, um, I think, three poems from Flight and then finish with three po poems from The Earth is Not Flat. Um, this is a love poem. It's about a belated honeymoon that my husband and I took to Paris. The hotel is as peculiar as described. Um, and, and it's not only a love poem to Chris, but also a love poem to the moon. It's called Hotel Mercure. I could say you loom and you wouldn't, could reach my hand to touch you, lucid swimmer, slick whipper snapping through my windows dark. Forgive me, could almost reach moon. Remember that hotel in the round, spinning us through the Paris night. You used it as your mirror, every hall curving out of sight into geometries continuous now. How did they slice our room? Pie-eyed, I recall only the bed, too small for anyone. Cheap wine, loaf, a living up to an idea. Surely we were happy in time, in time. And you, you haven't changed a bit. Um, and this one is actually appropriate considering that I'm about to be reading poems in which ice appears. Uh, it's called Refraction. Um, and it contains in the middle a very subtle little argument for the funding of basic science, which is something that we hope will continue. Uh, it will be maybe my only overt political statement of the evening, although in a sense the decision to read from the Antarctica book tonight is also kind of a political statement. Refraction. Because time passes more slowly in water than in air, everything floats, muscle, memory, and bone, all anything but light. I take my time, roundabout detour and angle to get to the point, even into your arms. Did you know a single point of light departs a crystal in so many directions at once? Say teepee, say traffic cone, say sorcerer's hat glammed with stars, both straight and wayward? Oh, my searchlight. Consider the mathematician noodling around like any poet daydreaming the improbable, then all at once stumbling over something useful? Not yet, centuries from now. Still, what's a dreamer only ever after beauty to do? Rub her eyes, bemused, shuck her jammies, check her watch, go out for beer. I am on the verge every moment of mislaying credit card, laptop, wits. Even you, my bet blanc, my obstacle, my great good dirigible, my distraction, I ask how do we live in this world knowing only everything we do? And then um, the last poem from this book is 
one of the few poems about poetry that I, that I have. Uh, it's called Poems 2.0. Um, and it's in numbered sections, which I'll just raise a finger when we're moving from one to the other. Some of the poets who are alluded to or even quoted in this poem, uh, everyone in this room will probably recognize, and some of them, I'm probably the only one who will know uh, who they are. Poems 2.0. They were in error, of course, about most things. The clouds never were soft. Inside, rambunctious then, as now, they struck and swizzled, composing pockets of violence, electrified. They had no time to think of being lonely. And the poetry of the earth, it could cease. We know that now. Flowers, for example, will take and take, will lash and tooth the air, will scatter and dig in and rise above themselves and flourish. Do not mistake me. This is no correction. Don't ask me to count the ways I have been wrong about love's same old la-di-da, or how I knew all along I could only betray the flesh that dazzled me into song, my own or his. A poem might have told us in so many words and others and been wrong. And then, I have a couple of minutes for this. Um, the, uh, I got to go, by Arctic, go to Antarctica by ship across the Drake Passage, which is unusual. A friend of mine uh, who had been um, read a first draft of this manuscript, and he emailed me and he said, listen, I can't believe that there's not a poem in here about your passage across the Drake. You sailed to Antarctica. Don't be modest. Write a poem about it. And I said, he, he said, I know you're not capable of bragging. And I said, oh, yes, I am. You just watch. <laughs> so this is sailing to Antarctica. This is the, the assignment poem. The problem is the voices I can't get out of my head. On the bridge, the captain's playing break on through. He's been playing stormy weather. <laughs> Go ahead. Google world's roughest crossing, Google shipwreck and lost at sea. Meanwhile, the ship is tearing itself apart, isn't it, beam by steel beam? The ship is gnawing its own liver, and the sea is eating its heart out and wants me to sashay right on by and take a look. Lean over the rail, little one. Lean a little farther. The problem is the voices. See, see, you're all foam vanishing, cry of sheer water and albatross wing knitting you to sky. You are height and depth and open mouth, and I am barely a morsel. See, I can't get out of my head, or is it you're what I can't get my poor head around, what I don't know how to measure, a 20-foot sea, a 30-foot sea, not a falling so much as a career, a sinking so much as a gulp. Measure from where the surface would be if I could find it, if the idea of surface hadn't become a moving target, I plummet past into the trough and know no better on the ride up into Yippee, though on the waves crest three days out, I would swear I could see South America. This is the best thing ever clinging to the rail, watching another wave crash all the way over the bow, over the captain high in his bridge, the captain who will carry us through with his instruments and playlist and steel hold gut, though he says everyone has a threshold, even him. Chris and Jenny, most of the passengers green in their berths along with half the crew. And me? I'm used to the world appearing to wish me well. All those summer weeks spent reading in the Jeep while Dad careened us down the roughest roads he could find, Mom hanging from some near cliff face by rope rigging. Isn't a mountain a wave moving slow? I am used to the best kind of luck and a stomach that can ride out anything, even the swell of my own hubris. All day I stand on deck with the birds and spray, Birds that can sail across oceans without moving their wings. Wherever I look, infinity's blue and gray, and I say, okay, already, give me all you've got. So that's going over. 
Um, and uh, a couple of short ones now, uh, and I'll be done. Um, this is called Terra Lab. Eh, maybe, maybe a little bit political. Um, there's a lot of research that happens down on Palmer Station and the other stations that is classified. Uh, and this is one of the places that is restricted, although they did allow poets, because we're harmless, uh, to take tours. Terra Lab. We are not allowed to take photographs, not allowed to tell you certain things or which things those are. The screens display results if you know how to read blues and yellows spiking and shading, showing the eye how much noise there is at each frequency. This place is clean, electromagnetically speaking. We can hear lightning strike anywhere in the world, shifted electrons whistling and cracking, diving back to earth, the wind playing its parts. If a nuclear bomb goes off, the instrument will notice. It moves its flibberty bits faster than sound. This, I believe, I'm allowed to tell you. I'm not allowed to show you how it's done. Above us, the ozone layer thickens and thins, and somebody knows that, too. A machine collects air and turns it into numbers. Someone plays the guitar, leaning in the corner. Me, I can't stop listening to the weather. Picture disturbance, and with it, a sky you knew, gone static, pinpricked, too dark. And then, uh, finally, winding down from relentless cheerfulness. Um, this is uh, <laughs> just my usual position in the world, relentless cheerfulness. This is um, rumors of topography, and it's actually, it's, it's about the way optical illusion um, works in, an, in Antarctica because you have reflection, refraction, mirage, all of these different things going on. Shackleton tells a story that appears in this um, during the, his dire, terrible journey, they're lost down there. Winter is coming, and because they're scientists, they know exactly when the sun is going to set uh, and not come up until, you know, m for months and months. So they watch it set. They have a drink of rum. They don't have a lot of rum yet, or whatever it is they're drinking, rum scotch. They have a drink, and then a little while later, they watch the sun come back up again and then set again and then come back up again, and then set again, and it does that three or four times before it sets for good. Rumors of topography. First decide where water stops and ice begins. Then where ice ends and land takes over, as if you will ever see the land here or anything lying under the ice that cannot shrug it off. Try beginning from the other end to discern exactly the line between sky and cloud, cloud and mountain. Nobody's settled anything yet. Try to decide where the horizon locates itself and whether the sun hovers above it or selfless illusionist has merely projected itself on the air. All for your pleasure, that show of light the moment darkness descends and threatens not to lift. For months also for your pleasure, the question, where darkness ends and you begin. Let me tell you that Tess Taylor, as you can tell, was a heck of a student. Um, it really is wonderful to be here with these two poets. Uh, a terrific experience, and uh, I just was so absorbed in hearing them read. Uh, this is what this kind of occasion ought to be like, and it ought to uh, stimulate the, ac uh, the appetite to read some more, which in this case, it sure does. I'm going to start uh, with... Uh, uh, I'm going to read, before I read from my new book at the Foundling Hospital, I'm going to read uh, three poems that are only, one not at all by me, are only kind of by me, uh, as a kind of invocation. The first one is my poem, Samurai Song, which is slightly ripped off from an ancient uh, 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 15th, 16th century Japanese model. Samurai Song. When I had no roof, I made audacity my roof. When I had no supper, my eyes 
dined. When I had no eyes, I listened. When I had no ears, I thought. When I had no thought, I waited. When I had no father, I made care my father. When I had no mother, I embraced order. When I had no friend, I made care my friend. When I had no enemy, I opposed my body. When I had no temple, I made my voice my temple. My tongue is my choir. I have no priest. When I have no means, fortune will be my means. When I have nothing, death will be my fortune. Need is my tactic. Detachment is my strategy. When I had no lover, I courted my sleep. Uh, the poem is not by me at all, is by the uh, Nicaraguan poet and political hero, uh, Ernesto Cardenal, whom I had the pleasure to meet a few years ago at a festival in Granada, Nicaragua, where I actually gave a poetry re reading with Cardinal. And I include this poem today. I posted in the online magazine Slate some poems that are in response to the uh, election results. And uh, I included uh, this poem. I'm going to resist the temptation to read it in Spanish. I'm going to read it uh, just in uh, Donald Walsh's uh, translation. It's one of the better titles I've read in a long time. The title is Somoza Unveils Somoza's Statue of Somoza at the Somoza Stadium. <laughs> could almost be a poem by itself, couldn't it? Somoza Unveils Somoza's Statue of Somoza at the Somoza Stadium. I don't know if that rhetorical figure of repeating your name a lot of times is familiar to you or not. And here's the poem. It's not that I think the people raised this statue to me. No. I know better than you that I ordered it myself. No, nor is it that I have any illusions about passing with it into posterity because I know the people will one day tear it down. Nor is it that I wished to erect to myself in life the monument that you will not erect to me in death. No. I put up this statue just because I know you'll hate it. <laughs> Sino que erigí esta estatua porque sé que la odiasis. Odiasis. <laughs> that... Uh, Second person familiar plural, Oriatsis. <laughs> That's why I put it up. Um, and uh, I, I will now read to you another poem that I put in that uh, little anthology I did for Slate. Uh, it's my um, version that I did with Czesław Miłosz of uh, his poem Incantation that he wrote when he was living in Berkeley. Uh, in the uh, 60s, he, he wrote it uh, uh, 20 years before Tess Taylor was born. Um, <laughs> and Cheslav always wanted to be clear that the poem is called Incantation. It's not necessarily his description of the world as it is, but it's a thing you say uh, as part of the process of bringing into being the world as it is meant to become. Incantation. Human reason is beautiful and invincible. No bars, no barbed wire, no pulping of books, no sentence of banishment can prevail against it. It establishes the universal ideas in language and guides our hands so we write truth and justice with capital letters, lie and oppression with small. It puts things as they should be above things as they are. It is an enemy of despair and a friend of hope. It does not know Jew from Greek or slave from master, giving us the estate of the world to manage. 
It saves austere and transparent phrases from the filthy discord of tortured words. It says that everything is new under the sun, opens the congealed fist of the past. Beautiful and very young are philosophia and poetry, her ally in the service of the good. As late as yesterday, nature celebrated their birth. The news was brought to the mountains by a unicorn and an echo. Their friendship will be glorious. Their time has no limit. Their enemies have delivered themselves to destruction. Let's all applaud Czesław Miłosz. <laughs> it keeps the person who did that from feeling embarrassed or something. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was at a performance uh, in New Haven of Ezra Latterman's uh, an oratory they wrote, and it seemed to me absolutely clear that we ought to clap between uh, movements. And I told the person next to me, I think we should clap between movements. <laughs> and I was the only person who did, <laughs> 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 because, you know, manners. Um, this book at the Foundling Hospital, um, for me, very much has an idea based on the idea of the foundling. The foundling is not like the orphan. The foundling is this little thing, and then it's told, this is your religion, this is your sex, that's your penis or your vagina. Oh, and by the way, you're Jewish, so we're going to cut a little of it off. And it all just is a mixed, a very mixed, not a pure set of things that come to the creature. And I am, um, I am in generally an enemy of purity. I like things that are mixed, and uh, I tend to suspect things that are based on... Uh, the idea of purity, uh, the idea that purity exists. To me, purity is uh, not a noble ideal at all. And most of the things I like are mixed, including um, American culture. And there is a, a poem in this book called Mixed Chorus. The chorus in the Greek tragedies, I always was sort of, uh, not always, I didn't know, but uh, when I went to college and read them, it was interesting that the chorus speaks in the first person singular. It's a lot of guys doing this dancing that's based on military drill, because you chant when you're fighting to keep it unified. And they say I in the singular. And this chorus, is in this poem called Mixed Chorus, is in the first person singular. At one point, the speaker is W.E.B. Du Bois. But it, it's also Irving Berlin. It's also the Roman poet Horace, whose father was a slave. I'm not pretending that being a slave in the Roman Empire was the same as being a slave in the American uh, 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 South or North. Uh, anyway, there are various speakers who, for me, I I the poem is uh, my appreciation of the... Uh, mixed col uh, in nature of all of us and of all culture. Mixed Chorus. My real name is Israel Bailin. My father was a Roman slave who gained his freedom. I was first named Ralph Waldo Ellison, but I changed it to the name of one of your cities because I was born a Jew in Bielorussia. I sit with Shakespeare, and he winces not. My other name is Flaccus. I wrote an essay on the theme, You Choose Your Ancestors. It won't be any feeble, Ivy League, conventional wings that I'll rise on. Not I, born of poor parents. Look, my ankles are changed already. New white feathers are sprouting on my shoulders. Those are my wings. Across the color line, I summon Aurelius and Aristotle. Threading through Philistine and Amalekite, they come all graciously and without condescension. I took the name Irving or Caesar or Creole Jack. Someday, 
They'll study me in Hungary, in Newark, and in L.A. So spare me your needless tribute. Spare me the red hideousness of Georgia. I wrote your white Christmas for you. And my third name, Berghardt, is Dutch. For all you know, I am related to Spinoza, Walcott, Pissarro. And in fact, my grandfather Burkhardt's first name was Othello. And <laughs> funny thing is, uh, W.B. Du Bois' uh, grandfather really was named Othello Burkhardt. And uh, a lot of this poem was written by Du Bois. That line of iambic pentameter, I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not, that's the first sentence in the last paragraph of his essay, uh, Disagreeing with George Washington Carver about the education of um, freedmen, of black people. Um, here is a poem called Creole. Creole. I'm sick of the gods. I'm pious about the ancestors, afloat in the wake widening behind me in time, those restive divisors. My father had one job from high school till the day he got fired at 30. The year was 1947, and his boss, planning to run for mayor, wanted to hire an Italian veteran, he explained, putting it in plain English. I was seven years old. My sister was two. The barbarian tribes in the woods were so savage, the empire had to conquer them to protect and clear its perimeter. So, into the woods, Rome sent out missions of civilizing governors and forces to establish schools, courts, garrisons. Soldiers, clerks, priests, citizens with their household slaves. Years, decades, entire lives were spent out in those hinterlands, which might be good places to retire on a government pension, especially if in your work years you had acquired a native wife. Often I get these things wrong, or at best mixed up, but I do feel piety toward those persistent mixed families in Gaul. Britain, Thrace. When I die, may I take my place in the wedge, widening and churning in the mortal ocean of years of souls. The Roman colonizing and mixing, the imperial processes of legal enslaving and freeing, involved not just the inevitable fucking, in all senses of the word, but also marriages and births, as developers and barbers, scribes and thugs, mingled and coupled with the native people and peoples. Begetting and trading, they had to swap, blend, and improvise languages. Couples especially needed to invent French, German, Spanish, those Creole tongues. And I confess, Roman, Barbarian, I find that Creole work more glorious than God. The way it happened, the school sent around a notice. Anybody interested in becoming an apprentice optician, raise your hand. It was the Great Depression. Anything about a job sounded good to Milford Pinsky, who told me he thought it meant a kind of dentistry. Anyway, Milford was bored sitting in study hall, so he raised his hand and he got the job, as was his destiny, full time after he graduated from high school. Joe Chavone, Joe Chavone was the veteran who took the job, not a bad guy. Dr. Weinberg did get elected mayor. Joe worked for him for years. At the bank, John Smock, an Episcopalian whose family once owned the bank, had played sports with Milford, and he gave him a small loan with no collateral, so he opened his own shop, grinding lenses and selling glasses. As his mother-in-law said, almost a professional. Optician comes from a Greek word that has to do with seeing. Banker comes from an Italian word for a bench where people sat, 
to make loans or change. Pinsky, like Tex or Brooklyn, is a name nobody would have if they were still in that same place. Those names all signify somebody who's been away from home for a while. Chivone, or schiavone, means a Slav or slave. Milford is a variant on the poet's names, Milton, Herbert, Sidney, that certain immigrants used to give to their offspring. And Creole comes from a word meaning to breed or create in a place. Two more poems. Grief. I don't think anybody ever is really divorced, said Lenny. Also, I don't think anybody ever is really married, he said. <laughs> because English was really Lenny's second language, and because of Yiddish and its displaced place in the world, he never really believed in his own prose. He wrote sentences the way a great boxer moves. Near the end, he told me, I'm in hell something Lenny might have said about hunting for a parking space in Berkeley. <laughs> Mike, too, was himself. His last month, too weak to paint or make prints, he sat and made drawings of flowers, ink attentive to rhythms of beech rose, wisteria, lily, forms like acrobats or Cossack dancers. Mike had a vision of his body dead on his studio floor, seen from high above. He didn't feel sad or afraid at seeing it, he said, just sorry for the person who would find it. You can't say nobody ever really dies. Of course they do. Lenny died. Mike died. But the odd thing is the person still makes a shape distinct and present in the mind as an object in the hand. The presence in the absence. It isn't comfort. It's grief. I'll read the title poem, The Family Tokens, and then we'll be finished. And uh, Tess and Kate and I will be happy to sign books and uh, to uh, schmooze in a friendly way. The Foundling Tokens. At the Foundling Hospital, for each abandoned baby, a duly recorded token, a bit of lace or brooch, identifying coin, button, bangle, a crushed thimble, noted at admission, or paper. At the family museum, a wall displays hundreds of scraps, each pinned once to some one particular infant's nighty, nappy, or blanket, each with surviving particulate ink or graphite in studied lines, betokening a life. Sometimes verses quoted or composed. Quote, I'll say it aside, this is an actual poem that this woman left with her baby. Quote, Hard is my lot in deep despair, to have no help where most should find. Sure, nature meant her sacred laws should men as strong as women bind. Regardless he, unable I, to keep this image of my heart. Tis vile to murder, hard to starve, and death almost to me to part. If fortune should her favors give that I in better plight may live, I'd try to have my boy again and train him up the best of men. End quote. To have, meaning to reclaim, but also in the mind to have again that same foundling, paternity regardless, the same boy again, reconceived. Token, meaning a least irreducible particle of meaning, or token, meaning token black token woman, token gesture. They sent the infant foundlings to wet nurses, mostly out in the country. The foster mother, by contract, after a few years, returned the child ready for schooling to the foundling hospital. Unconsulted but retained, that relic syllable of lines, bauble, or needlework. 
On the slave passage, some Africans inscribed their true names into the hull as though someday to be pronounced again. Also, the Chinese immigrants in the dark Angel Island internment cells of San Francisco, many to be deported, wrote verses found on the walls above their bunks. Fragment of a tune, rhyme, name, mumbled from memory, incised into a bar of soap, or even scraped into the very death compound dirt, or hut dirt, or chalked onto pavement, scratched or smeared or intoned betokening, or in the ordinary plight of insomnia, reciting memorized avenues through the expanses of loss, although almost never was a foundling reclaimed, ever. Thank <laughs> you.